thank you so much for joining me today, Rohini and Danushka. I'm so excited to get this conversation started. So this is going to be um, an interview or a casual conversation between the three of us about pedagogy, particularly in the Asian context. Um, I'm going to start by introducing myself. My name is Singmin and I was a research assistant with the Trilla team and have now moved on to other things, but not, but I still miss it and that's why I'm here. Um, and funnily enough, I feel quite inadequate to be here because I've never engaged in the practice of pedagogy. I'm not an international law teacher by any measure. In fact, I've only really been um, a student of international law in my undergrad course. And that is the only exposure I have with um, international law pedagogy. But it did get me thinking. Um, and, and the way that I learned international law was very didactic, very lecture based. Um, and so I'm interested to hear what both of you have um, imagined for a more dynamic, more engaging form of international legal education. But before that, um, can I get both of you to introduce yourselves? Maybe Danushka can, can go first. It's really good to have this conversation with the two of you and to continue on a dialogue based on this uh, begin introduction. Um, I'm Danushka Madhavatra and I have been a senior lecturer at the University of Colombo at the Faculty of Law. I technically teach constitutional law, comparative constitutional law, and international humanitarian law at the undergraduate level and at the postgraduate level. I work as the course director for human rights. Um, I have my postgraduate degree from Harvard and I will be soon going to Kent Law School to pursue my doctoral studies on ethnicity, international law, and gender. So I'm really looking forward to that. And in addition to the academic work, I've also been engaged in human rights work for the past 10 years. I have worked with a lot of community service organizations and civil society associations in Sri Lanka. I've also been a consultant to, to the Ministry of Women and worked with UN. Rohini? Yes. Thank you. It's wonderful to have this conversation with the two of you. Uh, but before I introduce myself, Jingmin, I think the fact that you have engaged with pedagogy as a student is probably one of the most profound ways of discussing pedagogy. So by no means are you ill-equipped to join us in this conversation. If anything, I think you offer a very important perspective on pedagogy. Um, so I'm Rohini. I have been an assistant professor at the Jinder Global Law School for the last 10 years. Currently, I'm also pursuing my PhD from the Warwick Law School. And I teach critical approaches to international law, third world approaches, queer and feminist understandings of methods in international law. So my PhD is in a way an extension of my last decade of teaching. And in my PhD, I am reflecting on what does doing twail in the classroom really mean? When we say we are doing twail, is there a specific way of doing it in the classroom? How do we relate to our teaching? What does that mean for the content in terms of where international law is going and so on and so forth? So I've just transitioned from teaching to thinking about teaching. I love that. And I love the diversity of backgrounds that both of you have. I think um, it definitely would shape how you teach um, and how you interact with your students in the classroom. Um, and on that note, maybe I can just start with a general question about what is pedagogy and why, why do you think we should be talking about it? Yeah, sure. Um, so you know, this is interesting because I'm looking at this as part of my work. I think pedagogy means different things to different people. Sometimes within the constraints of an institution, people think of pedagogy as a specific teaching method you deploy in the classroom. Sometimes people think of pedagogy as how are you creating your curriculum and delivering it in the classroom. Uh, personally, I think of pedagogy and I obviously, you know, uh, have come to this definition from the work of other people who've reflected on critical pedagogy. I think of pedagogy as a multidimensional experience. It doesn't, and much like the process of teaching actually, I don't think it starts at the classroom or ends at the classroom, begins at a state where you are not just curating content, you're thinking about what your classroom is all about, who are in it, how are you relationally located vis-a-vis -vis who they are, what kind of institution do you work in? So for me, pedagogy, incorporates all of these elements. Also spaces like family, which are 
definitive institutions that have a huge impact on the classroom space as well. So I would try to think of it as this interconnected process with multiple stakeholders, diverse forms of identities that are constantly being you know, made and remade in various ways. So for me, pedagogy is precisely that. And I also like to remind ourselves that you know, um, teaching is very much a social process. Very often we come to the institution thinking that we are acquiring a lot of knowledge here, but it's also another cog in the wheel. The teachers are a part of the social process where they are located contributes to this. So both pedagogy and teaching invariably are a part of a larger machinery. And in other words, I think it's a very human job with very human dimensions located within a system. So that's how I see pedagogy to foreground these facets of it. I'll think back on some of the ideas that Rohini contributed. It's definitely multidimensional. And as she said, it's relationally located. And when you said it's also about who is there in the classroom, the teachers, the students, it goes into that experiential aspect of learning. So it's not about what you accumulate in a classroom. And the identities that are present there, not only are they diverse, it also factors in for us to think about and for them to think about in terms of identity politics and what does that identity politic bring into the class. And when you look at it from that perspective, it's also important for us to understand because of these diversities that they come into a particular course having in their heads perhaps an idea about what that course is going to be like, which they might end up recognizing and relating to in class or might have to struggle to resist or to absorb in the class and thereafter. So all of this also adds to it. I do not necessarily think of pedagogy as just the methods of teaching. I completely agree with uh, Rohini here. I think it's also about how do you learn what you learn and what do you have for yourself as aims? And this is particularly important in the kind of context that we come from. There is a tradition that perhaps legal education or university education should go in a particular direction and it's very industry oriented perhaps and it doesn't necessarily give students a chance to absorb what they think and think, think about things in a different way. Um, so in terms of choosing the aims, there are different angles that you will have to work with. As Rohini said, there are different stakeholders. So it's only not, not only about the students and what they want, it's also about what does the institution want and what perhaps the government wants in a particular setting for university students to go into. So it also looks into how do you shape conduct? How do you respond to conduct and thinking patterns that have been formed before? How do you resist and locate your understanding of a particular subject in all of its elements? Those are such interesting points. And I, I like particularly how both of you talk about pedagogy being different things to different people and in different and can take different forms in different contexts. Um, and maybe I can just um, on the back of that, ask both of you how both of your thinking about your the way that you practice pedagogy has been shaped by um, maybe the cultures in which you um, are situated, the organizations that you that you are currently maneuvering. Um, what does that look like for you, and is it? And, and what are the kind of pressures that you faced in trying to forge your own independent pedagogical practice yeah I was thinking I think I formed my ideas about pedagogy much later I'm not particularly proud about having formed it much later but I think it took me a couple of years in teaching uh, to actually start thinking about how do I teach what I teach because it's also a, a field that you go into with very little training if at all you get any training just because you have gotten a good set of qualifications doesn't necessarily mean that you have inculcated in you the ability to actually teach it to someone uh, and teach it to yourself um, so it was a difficult process for me especially because there are certain traditions that are entrenched in our field, in the legal field, where certain textbooks are the recommended texts, you don't want to talk about anything else. It's the mainstream narrative. And if you don't buy into that mainstream narrative, then there are other repercussions that can come through because of course, lecturers and examiners are also human beings and their entrenched perceptions about a particular subject 
perhaps you don't want to challenge that at an examination. So perhaps that's not something the students, all students think about when they're students. So that, that definitely was a pressure that I was feeling. And in the classes, after I started teaching international law, one of the biggest challenges that I felt was the lack of materials coming from the domestic context. And even when there was literature coming from the domestic context, that had to reach a particular standard or a particular approach of writing in order to get accepted as the kind of literature that one would want to recommend in a classroom. So local perspectives is not necessarily something that you would take on board without struggling about what you're taking on board. And one of the other reasons why I wanted to think about how I teach what I teach and how students learn what they learn is because there is this approach to studying, which is just listening to what a lecturer would say and the lecturer also feeling like they have to narrate something that the students can take down, which has been referred to in literature as a narration sickness. Mm -hmm. And coupled with this also, you take interests of the students, like how are they satisfied? Do you want them to think in the class or do you just want them to give a you know, checklist that they can tick off and pass an examination? So the, the other aspect comes from the practice, the legal practice where you would want a university to produce court-centric practitioners, which I think is just one way of looking at the practice of law or understanding of law, understanding of international law, so on and so forth. And the reading materials that have been generated for the longest time have been um, oriented along different standards. Western oriented, maybe male oriented, the, the intersectionalities doesn't necessarily come up. So those were the fundamental reasons why I started thinking, thinking about pedagogy. And then I wanted to have a dialogic kind of approach to teaching in class, which would give a chance to the students to counter what I say, teach me something while I teach them. Because I think that was something that was really missing in most of the classes that I have experienced as a student. Rohini? This is very interesting, you know, um, because it made me think of a lot of things in relation to what you were saying. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about before I move on to, you know, my own pedagogical journey is teaching is an extremely laborious, draining, affective process. And this is something we need to constantly remind ourselves because, and you will see this in all stages of teaching, we can't quite put a finger on where it starts and where it stops. And this makes it very problematic, problematic in terms of what exactly is a teacher's job and what does it entail. Institutionally, I also want to bring it in contrast to the idea of research, because the output of teaching is not tangible. The demands on teaching are very, very high and very, very differential. And there's also a presumption that if you are doing exceptional research on a subject that somehow will translate into good teaching, it doesn't necessarily happen that way. So I want to preface this with the fact that research very often has nothing to do with teaching. So your resume in that sense doesn't speak to your teaching abilities per se. It's a process where you learn on the job for sure, but it's also a process that is incredibly intangible and amorphous. So quantifying it, comparing it, monetizing it to the idea of research is in itself very, very problematic. And most of the institutions we teach in tend to operate within this paradigm. Um, so my pedagogical journey is interesting because earlier it was very performative, especially in international law. I was constantly thinking about how to deliver this content in the most accessible, most interesting way. And much like Danushka, and I wasn't thinking of these as challenges back then, I found the content difficult to deliver. And there's certain things you couldn't make interesting beyond a point. But I think the first two years of my teaching, that's all I was thinking about. How can I make this more engaging in a classroom? It's from the third or fourth year of my teaching that I started seeing myself in relation to the subject. And it just occurred to me that I'm not in the curriculum in international law at all. People like me don't exist as knowledge makers, as producers and so on and so forth. And that produced a huge dissonance for me. And in a way where I no longer was able to teach mainstream international law, I've spoken about this and written about this in a blog, but this was extremely debilitating because these are not the kind of conversations you have in teaching. And I would ask myself, what am I teaching and why am I teaching this? This is not doing anything for me. 
And then I started teaching a course called Many Faces of International Law, Critics and Limits. This is where my journey of expressly teaching critical approaches began. Once I started doing that, then I started looking at the classroom more relationally. So earlier it was about me and the curriculum, then it became about who is in the classroom and what sort of curriculum are we curating. And my own engagement with the law and the questions I was asked very often, you know, like you said that the idea is dialogic, you learn from your students. The experience of that was incredibly profound. So I remember two distinct moments where somebody asked me a question on a text I was teaching and I had no answer to that. Not in the sense that, oh, I don't know the answer, but I'm like my epistemological limits don't know how to comprehend this answer. And that was very, very, you know, um, it was one of those insightful moments that started making me think that pedagogy is a continuous process. And then I started thinking differently, not just about the readings I'm offering in the classroom, but what sort of content I'm offering at all. Does it have to be a reading? Can it be an image? Can it be other sources that we don't typically consider to be knowledge? Which then led me to, you know, as you were saying, what are some of the pressures and challenges? Then it just led me to the uh, inevitable confrontation of work in a neoliberal institution. You are fundamentally monetizing labor here. You have to teach two hours. You have to lecture for two hours. If you're already operating within those constraints, you can't be very creative. You can't question these you know, pedagogical processes, whereas in your mind, you already know this is ineffective. So those sort of questions then started coming to the fore. And that's part of what I'm trying to understand in my PhD um, institutionally. I, I, so for me, this PhD is also a very collaborative exercise. This is not me sitting and reflecting on pedagogy. This is me hoping to speak to a lot of colleagues who think they are doing twill and ask them, you know, what, what does it mean to you? How do you want to tackle these challenges? Can we collectively do something together other than being limited by institutions in various ways? And it's something you mentioned earlier about the outcome, because institutions produce these marketable outcomes, you're constantly clashing with them. So at some point, I think we have to ask ourselves really difficult questions like, are universities the place to explore and imagine pedagogy as creatively as we want to, or are we always going to be limited? So you know, these are, these are some of the challenges I came across in my pedagogical journey and challenges that I hope to discuss and be in dialogue about with all of you constantly. So I think this is sort of, you know, one step towards that. If I may add something to what Rohini was saying when she mentioned like, can you, do you have to always rely on textbooks or can you bring an image? This is something that I have been struggling with also. I, I'm very passionate about the pop culture, images, poetry, dramas, series episodes anything that can be used in classrooms to make it interesting as Rohini said because it has to be relatable at the end what that poses uh, uh, it poses a question for us as academics I think Rohini because sometimes when we try to use those images or poetry to unpack a question of law then there is the chance that you will be seen by the rest of the mainstream academia as less of an academic because you're bringing in analytical tools that are not generally used so that I think is also another challenge that we need to address in terms of you know how we think about research how we think about pedagogy and what we take to class yeah and I think that speaks to more structural problems in how law is understood in the law school. Um, I guess the, 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 the idea of law that we're fed is one of law as a science, you know, we, we use the case method and we, we rely on case law so heavily because um, law is a neutral solution that is applied to different problems and we don't have to interrogate you know who created these rules that we are using to yield in the end unjust outcomes mm. um, and so maybe I can ask I think it, it's interesting what you talked about Rohini with um, about the neoliberal institution of the university and I think it, that very much relates to what is the relationship between the law school and the legal profession? Um, and I think maybe that is one of the reasons why there has not been that much self-reflexivity about um, pedagogy in the, in the teaching core of the law school. And I was wondering why you think that pedagogy still occupies 
a marginal position in international legal scholarship. Um, yeah, anybody, maybe Rohini, you can take the lead. This is a great question, you know, one that I think of very often. So pedagogy as an academic line of inquiry has people engage with it. We know of work on emancipatory pedagogy and so on and so forth. Um, uh, to that end, actually, I was thinking maybe um, once we're done with the podcast, we can curate some interesting readings on pedagogy and international law for you know our listeners, whoever they are. Um, so there is work on pedagogy. There's also some work on legal pedagogy. But somehow, the pedagogy of international law seemed to not be something that's in discussion very frequently or in mainstream discussion very frequently. And while I was trying to conceptualize you know, the framework of the PhD, I had to hunt for work that spoke of the pedagogy of international law. And my understanding to this is there is this you know, a historicity to international law in general that feeds into the pedagogy invariably. Even the earlier work on teaching of international law speaks more about how international law is constantly grappling with politics. And that becomes a difficult process for the purpose of teaching it. But what kind of politics, what sort of geographical implications, how does identity play a role in it? These are not conversations that happened while teaching of international law was being discussed. Having said that, I have to say that the work that we are doing now obviously borrows heavily from the work that was done earlier. It wouldn't be possible to be here and talk about um, pedagogy of international law, or pedagogy of critical international law without the undergirding of critiquing international law to start with. So it's very important. At the same time, it does surprise me that the reflection on teaching and pedagogy did not happen simultaneously. One reason I think is, you know, um, this general assumption that teaching is somehow not a social process. And it's much like the understanding of law which is seen as this reified transcendental thing you just obey, teaching is just also seen as an activity that disseminates knowledge. We don't problematize teaching enough and therefore we don't seem to talk about pedagogy enough. That's one reason. The second, I think, and we'll talk about this at length, is international law inhabits different temporalities. International law in Europe is different from international law in Asia and from other parts of the world. Uh, because international law inhabits different temporalities, its teaching invariably also inhabits different temporalities. Because we've always framed international law as this linear journey towards development, which it is not, the teaching is somewhat mischaracterized and schizophrenic. We don't document it because of this dissonance with international law. So it's very interesting. I think the number of things we'll find if we start scratching the surface of teaching of international law is incredible. And we've only just started doing it partly in relation to something I think we'll talk about, which is decolonizing the curriculum. But before we move to that, uh, Vanishka, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, when you said that there is an ahistoricity to understanding critical international law, I think it's also because that the mainstream narratives have almost hegemonized the understanding of law in general, even before we go to international law. International law at the outset has got sidelined as a quote unquote soft law, although those narratives are somewhat dissipating right now. It is not completely eliminated. So that creates a challenge because critical international law and thinking about studying and teaching critical international law becomes a subset of that soft law which people are from the outset you know worried about getting into as academics because they seen as you know someone who's not engaging in the mainstream inquiries into law teaching as a social activity the biggest problem that i see with that is that when you don't understand what it entails it is just looked at as some ivory tower inquiry done by people who have power and privilege and the time to think about stuff don't that don't really matter at the grassroots levels. But that's not true. Thinking about these ideas and how students think about it and what they end up becoming later would definitely have a massive impact on the policy outcomes that come from international law or, or the decisions that governments make in this regard. So I think it's also a challenge of, you know, understanding the actual impact of teaching. 
And this is challenged by what I said, some, something that I said earlier as well. Our understanding to international law has been lopsided and, and therefore it creates an entrenched understanding, which is archaic and people don't want to move away from it. Mm. And I think this hegemony in the approach is what makes it really challenging. I suppose what's interesting and what distinguishes domestic from international law is that in domestic law, it's pretty easy to to see who the law serves, right? It's basically the people in power in the domestic order. But in international law, it's the, the person or the power, the people or the stakeholders who hold power have been written out of the story. So they're invisible. It's very difficult to, to trace mm who the structures of international law are benefiting. And I think that's particularly troubling for people in Asia, as we'll talk about later. Um, Professor Tony, in his um, blog, in Opinio Juris, talks about how students in Asia are just not interested in international law because it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's relevant to their daily lives. And we can see why. Um, and so maybe we'll talk about the next question, which talks about the movements that are hoping to make international law more relevant in, in everyday life um, with things like critical race theory and with things like the decolonized movement, um, the decolonizing the curriculum movement, which has kind of taken hold in law schools and in universities all over the world. Um, so what do you think is the relationship between these progressive movements and pedagogy? How does it impact upon pedagogy? And do you think these movements are focusing a little bit too much on what is being taught at the expense of how it is taught? Um, maybe we can begin with Danushka. Okay, so when you said, uh, when you gave that example of uh, Professor Angi and students not thinking of ILS something relevant, that's something that I have had to literally respond to in some of the classes, especially when I try to teach international humanitarian law in my law school, in the vernacular. The biggest question that I'm asked is, is it relevant now? Why should we be studying this? This is an additional optional subject. What are we going to do at the end of studying it? Do we have a job? So it's always looked at from this particular perspective. So I think it's very important for us to sort of think about other things like decolonizing, or critical race theory, all of this in the light of the practical questions that the students ask. So I, one of the reasons why students would see a dissonance between what is taught in class and what they're going to do after they finish the course is particularly because they cannot relate to what they read. They cannot relate to what they read because it is not written from their perspective. It's not at all close to what they experience in a day-to-day -day life. So it's just idealistic set of norms or rules or what is written about it. Then, and when you take that into class and tell them this is, this is important, it's valid for them to ask us the question, why do you say it's important if we can't locate ourselves within what you're teaching us? And I don't think we are risking something by focusing on um, what is taught at the expense of how it is taught. I, I say that because how you teach something is intrinsically, inherently interlinked with what you teach. Because what you teach would really determine the perspectives that you bring in, the questions that you ask, the food for thought that you will be giving. And it would give something that the general set of readings that have not been decolonized yet would have. For instance, the, what you, the reason and why we go into that decolonize this curriculum movement is because there is a lack of participation in it. And that participatory element is exactly what you try to bring in through that. And with that, what you're trying to do is to give to the students and to ourselves an opportunity to locate what is lost in the previous narratives within the narratives that you're trying to set now. So it gives you a standpoint from which you can look at the past and what has been taught in the past, and to look at the future with a new set of eyes, a new set of questions. That participatory element and locating yourself and finding what is lost, the sense of self that is lost in this region especially. I think that's why it's important for us to look at what is taught. 
I don't think we are running a risk of, you know, how something is taught. I think we are essentially addressing the problem of how something is taught by focusing on what is taught. Um, so before I talk about, you know, the specific aspect of decolonizing the curriculum and how it relates to teaching, the content method, the whole conversation around that, I want to um, talk about three things that are very important, not just specifically to decolonizing, but to our overarching discussion. The first is, in this, you know, when we were talking about doing international law, teaching international law, we talk about every institution, but the knowledge making institution. So it becomes important to think of who the interlocutors of these knowledge spaces are, which in this instance would be us or others who occupy similar positions to us. So problematizing the knowledge paradigm of international law, the hegemonic aspects of it, and identifying who its various interlocutors are, are very important in terms of understanding the decolonizing the curriculum process. In relation to that, it's very important to understand what academic institutions end up generating in this space. Now, we've spoken of this before, I think in more informal conversations, but I do want to talk of it more explicitly. This idea of intellectualizing men's work as theory and not understanding any other kind of contribution to international law as having equally, you know, uh, equally relevant theoretical premise and so on and so forth. There's a very gendered understanding of what this is like. And it's also designed as aspirational within institutional spaces. So what I mean is when others enter academia, there's an aspiration to be recognized as a scholar, but that image of a scholar is a very white Western male. And it's not possible for everybody to obtain that aspirationally because we're just placed differently. But we don't question that as the aspiration. And that's where the problem emerges. So those, those positions are far and few. And those positions are normative only from a specific perspective. But everybody wants to occupy that place of recognition. And invariably, whereas we should be forging collaboration amongst each other, what we end up doing is also creating a sense of competition. So there are all these conflicting ideas in spaces that are also trying to do emancipatory and collaborative work. And the third thing is, when you're teaching critical approaches to international law, you're not just going up against institutional limitations and these ideas of academia, you're going up against something very, very fundamental, which is how your understanding has been wired up until that point. So you do three things. First, you defend your critical stance saying, no, I'm also saying something very legitimate. Then you question the mainstream stance in relation to the critique. And after that, you actually try to undo all the cognitive implications of that mainstream stance. You know, Fanon's work and a bunch of other extremely, you know, immersive, insightful scholarship tells us this, that we're not just up against content, we're up against how the content has been received and how it has informed the way we think. So critical scholarship already has multiple hurdles of dealing with people's brains and people's brains are unpredictable in the way they want to go. Now imagine these three things together in the context of decolonizing the curriculum. The reason I professed it like this is because everybody is coming from their own vantage point of what is decolonizing the curriculum. And people mean well, but you meaning well within this overarching context can sometimes generate more conflict than collaboration. And I think what's important is to understand who we are, what kind of decolonization are we imagining, where are we located in this matrix of conversation? And should we sometimes step aside and let somebody else speak? This doesn't happen, especially in light of the second thing I you know, foregrounded in terms of that scholastic aspirational position that we all want. So there are hundreds of us with diverse voices now wishing to occupy that position of a theorist that the quintessential white male has always occupied. In this, you have this decolonization business going on. So what I want to say is our reality is very messy and complex. And until we acknowledge that, we won't know where to go from here. Now to that end, I'm in agreement with Danushka in the sense that the content will invariably shape our thinking. And this is where the self-reflexivity element becomes very important. You either allow the content to reflexively inform your thinking or you don't. And here's probably where we need to seriously talk about 
teaching as a collaborative activity, as a collaborative space. Not a place where we are trying to one up each other, pull each other down, but genuinely reflect on if we want these things to change, what can we do? And this is where particularly I think a queer feminist approach becomes important. It's relational. It thinks of these relationships between ourselves, between institutions, between each other, and it at least gives you some sense of how to be an ally, which is a very, very difficult task, by the way. So I think these things are interwoven into the decolonize the curriculum space, the pedagogical space, and it is a form of pedagogy. What I'm thinking about teaching in relation to somebody else who's doing the work, as well as the people who are in the classroom and ourselves in relation to knowledge. So I think this imagination, this feminist imagination of relationally thinking of pedagogy is something that emerges from this conversation. For me personally, this idea actually came from the content. So at this juncture, I would also say that we're not risking too much when we are focusing on the content, provided we are also self-reflexively thinking about it relationally. I love those ideas. Thanks for introducing the idea of feminist and queer pedagogy. This is a little bit of an aside, but I remember um, reading a blog article by Professor Sarah Nowen. Uh, it came out in the the Egil Talk blog recently, and it talks about how um, there is a quite a gendered aspect, um, a quite a gendered dimension to reference letters that are written by professors for male and female candidates when they apply for graduate programs, and how when it's written for a a male candidate, what usually the qualities that are usually highlighted are things like this: this candidate is an excellent scholar; he's outstanding in his analytical skills but when it comes to female candidates the qualities that are highlighted are much more to do with she is hardworking, um, she is collaborative she's a very nice person um, and and that I guess feeds into you know what are the kinds of qualities that um, are valued in 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 a research and teaching institution in a university and maybe that's one reason why pedagogy has been kind of overlooked in international law because what we really want to what is being prized currently are the excellent you know scholarship rather than the collaboration and 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 you know helping one another and and just going through a process um, that will yield creative solutions or creative approaches to teaching and to research um, so yeah, I found that really interesting. Um, and going back to the idea of, of feminist and queer pedagogy, I did note, and this is something I should have mentioned um, way earlier in our conversation, but the fact that um, in the 2018 Trilla survey that was done, so this was a survey that was um, done across, I think, 63 academics, um, across Asia and the Trilla team in, in Center for International Law wanted to find out what are the current practices on in teaching and research across Asia for international law. And so it was a very extensive survey that looked at, you know, what are the types of textbooks being used? What is the state of awareness about different approaches to international law? Um, and when it came to looking at how familiar different faculties were with um, different approaches to, to legal theory. Um, with regard to feminist legal theory, we had 11.59% um, of respondents saying they are extremely familiar with feminist legal theory. Um, and queer theory was, was very far down the list. It only had 2.9% of respondents who said they are extremely familiar with that topic. Um, so how do you think then a greater engagement with these kinds of pedagogy, uh, th these kinds of theory um, would change international legal education? Um, do you want to begin, Rohini? Sure, yeah. I think we can take turns, so that'll make it, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, before I answer that, let me just quickly go back to something you said about you know how recommendation letters are written for men. Let me tell you, this is incredibly prevalent. This is how teaching evaluation is done for men and women. And every aspect, the 
spotlighting of certain qualities as this and the spotlighting of certain qualities as that. Now, this is very ironical because the qualities that are seemingly spotlighted for women as, you know, um, as something that they intrinsically possess are not just of inherent value to institutions, but they're critical to research. You cannot have excellent research without collaboration. And I say this again and again, most of the times the academic output is in the form of an individual. The academic research unit is perceived as an individual. That is not the case. Our ideas come from conversation, from reading the works of other people, from non-textual knowledge, you know, your circumstances around you. So this critically questioning what knowledge is and not just this Western institutional textual understanding of knowledge is fundamentally premised on collaboration. So to say that somebody is collaborative is probably just sort of um, acknowledging that they probably will make excellent research eventually. And compartmentalizing the two is a very, very reductive and gendered way of understanding it. But you're right, this is absolutely true. true. It's incredibly frustrating. And you know, it's, it's part of why we are having this conversation. And it kind of brings me back to what you said. I think thinking of international law in terms of queer and feminist the theory finds a way to articulate this rage. There's a lot of feeling around it. And these feelings are real and we all feel it, but somehow we pretend that academia has no feelings, which is beyond absurd. It's all about feelings. It's just some people are able to articulate that feeling as a theory, posturing and objectivity. This has a lot to do with how privileged they are. And if others are expressing these feelings, it becomes scholarship without standard. And we have a lot of feelings about that as well. So feminist theory and queer theory asks us to effectively acknowledge what we are and why we are feeling angry. We are feeling angry because our knowledge is dismissed, because we are not seen a certain way. Sometimes we are very complicit in trying to be a certain way. So all these complicated feelings that feminist and queer theory allows international law to assimilate in itself. I'll give you an example. Uh, it's something I've written about recently, and my work is heavily influenced by others in the past who worked on this. It's about what does international law look like? It looks like a quintessential European Christian male. We're always talking about the fathers of international law. If you imagine an event in international law and you try to think of it from a queer gaze or a feminist gaze, you invariably imagine a bunch of men wearing suits, sitting in some grand empaneled room talking about these world making ideas, but that's not what it is. But visually we've curated that image. So bringing these theories into conversation truly allow us to unpack the discipline for what it is. It allows us to see how you know, international economic law is not happening in a vacuum. The market is not a free space. It's an extremely textured, layered gender space that influences people's decision. Even through the lens of queering and feminist approaches, it's a space where a certain identity is prioritized over others. So critical approaches in general allow us to do that, but queer and feminist approaches allow us to do that more expansively and with feeling, and not seeing feeling as a bad thing in international law. To add on to what uh, Rohini was saying, I, I really liked your presentation of international law in that way because that is exactly how I weave it as well. And you can't blame people who look at it that way because that is exactly how it is. Even if you do find people who talk about international law from feminist or queer theory perspectives, there is a different level of perception about these individuals who talk about it. And they don't necessarily get to talk about the main aspects of international law because they are seen, seen as people who are talking from the sidelines of international law and not engaging with the main questions of international law. When in reality, what they're doing is essentially looking at the main aspects of international law from a different perspective. So I don't think this is also a, the necessity to engage more with this. And more engagement is not the problem. If that engagement is not different, and if you are not willing for that highlighted or increased engagement for, for, for that to be different, I think we are losing out a lot because we expect the scholarship or the writing or the research, the presentation, how we talk about it, for, for us to meet standards. If we are expected to perform in a particular way, irrespective of how many works we come out with, we are not going to tackle any of those issues. So more engagement is not the question here. And it's a question of whether we are willing to engage with it differently and accept the fact that 
um, academia everywhere and our questions of international law, especially from a queer and feminist point of view, are not going to be the same questions that others are going to ask from the mainstream perspective. So it also brings us to a question of whether there is a recentering. And the moment that you start talking about recentering the approaches, you are upsetting the structural frameworks that are in place. And upsetting the structural frameworks that are in place isn't good for that idealized aspect of international law or those who speak about an idealized aspect of international law because recentering would take away the attention that they are already getting and place it somewhere else and people don't want that because it's it's a prestige and it's a privilege to be in that center and when you ask all of these uncomfortable questions and point to all of the aspects of international law that are not comfortable that you don't want young women like us to be speaking of and you know kicking up a cloud of dust then you don't want it so it's a question of recentralization it's a question of impacting the established power dynamics the structures that are in place and it's a question of establishing different people at the center and understanding it doesn't necessarily have to have one center it's okay for it to have different focal points so to speak but it always goes back to that question of what is the accepted form what is the center and that i think is a fundamental problem here there's one thing I wanted to quickly add, you know, to what you said. Um, this idea that, you know, one has to engage differently is very, very important, particularly because it makes us think of solidarity a certain way. And this is something I've said before, so have others. And I say this in the most well-meaning way that even in Twail scholarship, the engagement with these ideas as something that all of us should do collaboratively have not necessarily been as robust as we would like it to be. So Twail scholarship also takes on a gender, gender texture sometimes. And this could be purely unintentional. It could be an oversight, but it's there. So it makes it difficult for Twail feminists, those who are working on queer theory or other perspectives, you know, ingrained within Twail and that are tackling gendered issues to work within the paradigm. And we really need to think of solidarity and collaboration within the framework of international law through these lenses. As in, our alliances can sometimes be strategic, they can be temporary, they can be across diverse issues, but just because somebody is geographically from the same region doesn't mean they have the same you know, agenda politically. This is something we need to understand. And for some reason, even though Twail completely envisions this in its scope and it tells you that the global south is a moving target, so is the global north and alliances are everywhere, the manner in which these alliances emerge have to be investigated, have to be subjected to a form of critique, just so that we understand how they manifest in international law as well. And that's what I was telling you earlier, that being an ally is difficult, forms of collaboration are difficult, and they have a lot of feelings around it. And this is precisely what queer feminist approaches allow us to acknowledge. Now you can feel both a sense of resentment about who you're in solidarity with because of their past injustices and at the same time you might want to build a sense of solidarity looking forward these can coexist and this is what feminist and queer scholarship in international law will tell us so you know i mean to that end i think the willingness to engage with it with this sort of self-reflexivity acknowledging that there have been oversights that we'll try our best to remedy the oversights is is very important since we are in the business of asking uncomfortable questions, um, I'm going to bring this conversation, loath as I feel to do it, to a close by asking quite a big final question that brings us back to the region that we, that we navigate, which is Asia. Um, so I'm going to ask about legal, legal pedagogy, international legal pedagogy in Asia. Um, and what I think about um, when I think about the academic community in in the international law academic community in in Asia is that it, it really isn't homogenous. So on the one hand, we have older respected scholars and they're quite entrenched in their domestic legal communities. They're quite powerful and they are the ones setting the standards for what is good scholarship and what are good what are good pedagogical practices um, 
in the institutions in Asia. And then on the other hand, there are more junior scholars. And within that community of junior scholars, you have a wide range of, um, you know, familiarity with the vernacular of um, international legal theory. Uh, you have people who have been abroad. You have people who have stayed domestic the whole way. What I'm trying to say is that the playing ground clearly isn't even. Um, there are loads of different stakeholders and they're all trying to find their voice um, within this community. And, and that against the background of an international legal community, the interactions with international law are still um, much less, less familiar than um, our counterparts in the West. So thinking about all these complex, um, this, this complex context in which we operate, um, how do we begin to unsettle the existing power matrices that, that shape um, international legal education in Asia? Um, and how do we begin to unsettle what is presently considered acceptable or approved pedagogy? It's a very big question. So um, yeah, take as long as you want to digest it before. Um, maybe I'll ask Danushka to begin with an answer. Yeah, as I said, it's a very difficult question to even begin to respond because there are so many different facets that one needs to consider in responding it because it can be unsettled, as you say, the existing structures can be unsettled in very different ways. It can come from curricular development to teaching in class, to research, publishing, where do you publish? How do you talk about it? Do you do a, a blog post? Do you do a podcast? All of these things would factor in to when you think about unsettling the existing structures. And the moment that you say that you have an emancipatory agenda or the moment that you use the word agenda, that is seen as something negative, something that has a negative connotation. So there are challenges that come that way as well. But rather than looking at, looking at the challenge as a barrier, I suppose we need to take it as a, as a welcome, refreshing opening into this whole idea of pedagogy from inter of international law from very different perspectives. And you did mention that there are people in the local context who, whose ideas are entrenched and who are seen as the people who set the standards. I think one of the biggest things, um, perhaps a controversial thing to say would be entrenched doesn't necessarily always mean correct. Entrenched doesn't necessarily always mean it's acceptable. And entrenched for now doesn't necessarily also mean that it should continue the way it is. I think academia should be broad-minded enough to grapple with that reality. Entrenched doesn't remain entrenched forever. So it's supposed to change. And you need to welcome people to come in. And speaking as a young academic from the Global South, I think I can speak for Rohini, myself, and Liu Jingmin. We come from cultures which give a lot of prominence to age. And if you were to challenge a scholarly view, sometimes that can even be taken as a personal attack, which it is not. So I think there is a lot of you know, soft skills that have to be built into academia in general for us to even begin to think about the larger meta issues that we are speaking of. You know, there, are, there are issues of microaggression perhaps when you challenge a scholarly view and that being taken as something that is entirely different. So the, uh, the spaces, the allowing or creating safe spaces for the younger academics to speak up and listening to what they have to say. I'm I'm not saying that we have to be agreed with all the time, but to listen to us and to see whether there is a different perspective that we're bringing in and whether that perspective in and of itself is something that is valuable, that you can consider, that you can engage with in a scholarly sense, I think is important. Uh, speaking for myself from a Sri Lankan perspective, I can say this is lacking in the context that I come from, which is a massive issue because it challenges uh, my ability to perhaps think of pedagogy of international law from a critical sense, because there are other challenges that I have to overcome before I begin to tackle the issues that we are talking of in this. So I think that's something that I would think of when you say academic community is not homogeneous or that there are entrenched views that need to be challenged from pedagogy of international law. 
these are really great points you know i mean this is so important to understand that these challenges are both embedded in academia and international law and then you're just you have multiple hurdles to cross while you're thinking about this long term pedagogic project I actually want to you know uh, continue with what you said first before i answer this question and add, add a few more things to it this aspect of knowledge the way it's constructed it doesn't rest in seniority and time now i'm not at all such i'm not going to make any friends with this comments clearly uh, i'm not at all suggesting that experience should be discounted it comes with its own relevance its own significance but the minute you start dogmatizing it that experience invariably translates to knowledge experience invariably translates to something that cannot be questioned that's where the problem starts and this understanding of time and duration as having something intrinsic to do with knowledge is equally problematic and by which i don't just mean time in academia i mean the longer you do something but you're not reflecting or thinking about it doesn't necessarily mean that you're able to diversify this fundamental epistemology of what knowledge constitutes in the first place so we really need to push back against this while being mindful of what are the ways in which experiential understanding of your time in academia and your time outside of academia contributes to it so we're sort of going back to this problematizing how we construct knowledge it's not you know it's something we spoke of earlier it's not textbooks it's not your tenure it's not your branding it's something a lot more profound than that and we really really need to problematize it and this is very prevalent in asia is hierarchical understanding and you see this in conferences who is delivering the keynote and i get it some of this is tokenism and maybe maybe it serves other purposes because institutions also run on different kinds of goodwill but to equate that with knowledge is i think fundamentally wrong and then i come back to you know your question of um, when we think of where we are teaching geographically what is international law in asia i think this is a very important question international law and i can speak of this from the perspective of india it used to be this very boutique subject that very few people would be interested in doing it was done very traditionally um with very little imagination of how it relates its historicity significance in asia so on and so forth so very ironical because a substantive body of 12 scholarship and even 12 movements have emerged from asia which is not to say that the thinking has always been generic it means that we've tried at some point we've gone back to this you know very very traditional conservative institutional understanding of international law where somehow we were perfectly fine with the fact that it's going to be a historical in a region that probably needs to engage with history the most so that's the context it's a very a historical account and other other sort of constraints in make this difficult as well there are resource constraints we barely get the books that western institutions do all of this is done in english and not vernacular that in itself is reasserting that form of hegemony again i mean you know intelligence can be expressed in different forms and in different languages it doesn't have to come through english but that mindset is so prevalent even as we do international law the fact that if there are practical values to knowing english somehow gets transcribed into oh there are intellectual values to understanding who you are so there are resource constraints there are language constraints there are institutional constraints of what we do and then this a historical imagination of international law on top of that what are we understanding as aspirational as the standard as a role model you see institutions in asia aspiring to be a western institution why western institutions as resources great make the resources available you don't have to model yourself on every single thing that a western institution is doing i know very interesting work being done in india that doesn't even call itself critical approaches to international law it's you know very home grown very indigenous but it's just not foregrounded the same way because not mainstream not branded and so on and so forth so we also need to think of how we can regionally curate narratives and when i say regionally curate i don't just mean this happened in asia i mean re center knowledge sources re center epistemology not necessarily always presume that those institutional standards are the only standards that exist and one of the biggest examples of that is how we write and the you know what is considered to be good writing what is an acceptable format of writing i'll give you an interesting example some time ago i came across um different forms of writing that were practiced in ancient japan 
particularly through the lens of theater, script, movies, and so on and so forth. But these were textual writings. And these textual writings fundamentally differ from the way we learn to write in law schools or the way we are told we should write any legal text, you know, international law included, introduction, body, conclusion. One interesting example was it said that it thinks of writing as a tempura batter where you remove the batter to get to the good stuff. So it asks you to do some work, to think about what you're reading and it not just being served to you on a platter in a particular way. So, you know, just sort of thinking of these as standards of writing as well, and not just constantly going to European continental understanding of international law, philosophy, and so on and so forth. So our challenges are twofold, I would say. One is there are significant resource constraints. Two, imagination of international law is, is very limited. Pushing back against it is very hard. Three, something Danushka said, when people like her, people like me, come into the discipline, the odds are already stacked against us. So by the time we get to a point where we are able to amplify a particular form of pedagogy, we're exhausted because we're dealing with 200 other things. So, you know, I mean, the question you asked is massive and I think we could only just throw in a few of our reflections, but it, it, these are some of the things we seriously need to think about, problematizing each of these categories and how we work through them. Let me add something to what Rohini said and the tempura batter. You know, one of the biggest challenges, I think, when you try to I think do some might, law. Some might argue that the tempura, the whole batter is is good stuff. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Danishka. <laughs> yeah, what I was going to say is that you said that when you take off the batter, you get to the good stuff. I think one of the challenges that we have in the South Asian region is that sometimes you think of international law as an onion and you peel off all of the layers just to be left with nothing and I think that's a bad approach too because if you're bringing the localization if you're bringing the domestic perspectives you have to bring a perspective and I don't think we should get lazy about what we do and say yes we are going to challenge the international perspective or, or the existing mainstream narrative and leave it empty without giving it anything I think because of the resource allocation issue that Rohini spoke of, which is a fundamental problem in this part of the world, and because how it impacts our understanding, our learning, our teaching, the ability to engage with new resources, it also creates a, a gap in our understanding as well as our approaches. And when you translate that into trying to bring something new, there is that possibility of you know, giving up on the standards, which I think is the lazy approach to take. And I have seen that happening in some contexts and I'm worried about it when we are speaking about issues like this, that someone will catch it from the wrong end. So it's not about losing the standards. It's about creating standards which are different, which are capable of challenging existing matrices which are not helping us to unpack international law in a way that will be beneficial to everybody in the society with a particular interest in South Asia in this conversation. I know we are running out of time but very quickly I wanted to add two important things and you know this is useful information for all of us. One of which was recently I learned that um, the publishing industry operates in a way that is geared towards disadvantaging the global south. Those prices for books are unaffordable for us. They are predominantly library copies, but library copies that largely institutions in the global north can afford, and maybe a few rich institutions in the global south. So it's just designed that way. And in course of inquiring about, you know, asking them about what is then available for the global south, we learned that you can crowdsource, you can crowdfund a way to make your book accessible to the global south and say that it's open access, but the process of doing that is equally expensive. Similarly, if you want to procure a resource that's indigenous to one of the global south region, most of the global north libraries will probably have one copy or two copies at the very least, and then that's it. Now, to me, this is also international law, the way the publishing industry is designed in terms of access, not just what um, resource of international law that we are referring to, but the whole institutional dynamic of how one is disadvantaged as against the other. This is a very important uh, thing to remember. It's not just resource constraint, it's structurally designed resource constraint that is very much a part of what we are doing. 
And I think these sort of conversations also need to happen in international law, specifically in the context of where we come from, which brings me to the second thing. Very often when I started teaching critical approaches to international law, a few of my students would come and tell me, why are you teaching us this? Why are you not teaching us how to play the game better? Tell us how to rig the doctrine. Don't tell us the context of the doctrine. To them, I would say that you can't rig the doctrine if you don't know the context, if you don't know how the odds are stacked against you. Sometimes you may be able to, but that speaks to how international law co-opts different kinds of transnational elites. It doesn't talk about, it doesn't speak to its inclusive nature. It speaks to the fact that the global north is a moving target and that there are inequalities in spaces that are geographically the global south as well. So if you make it, it's not because international law is being generous, it's because you've been homogenized and somebody else has been disadvantaged. And this is, I think, where the conversation needs to be in terms of what sort of teaching we are doing in Asia. But it, it's a difficult place to get to because you know it rubs people the wrong way. But yeah, no. I just wanted to throw that in before we wrap up this very exciting conversation, which clearly none of us want to wrap up. But. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, unfortunately, that is all we have time for. But you're right, like listening to this conversation, listening to both of your brilliant thoughts has made me so excited for what can be possible in international law in Asia if there, all the conditions are right. And I guess if we fight hard enough, and I guess that means we will be exhausted. But someone has to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Danushka and Rohini, for joining me today. Um, I really hope that we have, you know, colleagues all over Asia who are going to listen to this and who are going to take that back to their classrooms because I think it's really important um, what we've discussed today. So, yeah, thank you so much. And um, for all those who are listening, um, we will be curating a sort of reading list, a resource um, bank that you could refer to in thinking more reflectively about your pedagogical practices, um, look out for that.